sharing these with our community that's that's of interest so then here's hat switch mountain club uh the telluride mountain club is really really pleased to be working with the peter inglis avalanche fund to bring these uh really important series of, of snow science education pieces to you all we're so grateful to john tuckman and bex hodgetts and luke jeremy jeremy yanko thank you for coming all the way over from Silverton. Thanks, yeah. everyone. And uh, everything that's going on. The Telluride Mountain Club right now is working specifically on a lot of trails, um, work towards the future in our entire region. So if you go to the Telluride Mountain Club website, there is a survey that you can take part in. Um, our trails, turns out, we use them a lot around here. And everybody has an opinion about how they get used. This is your moment to use that. You know, so go fill out that survey on the Children's Mountain Club website. There's a lot of really cool info there. And talk, you know, just talk to us about what you need. We're working with the National Forest, with local organizations, trying to make sure that folks in our area get to use trails long into the future in the ways that we need to. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to John Tuckman. Thanks, Thanks John. Joanna. Thanks. Thanks, thanks all you guys for coming tonight. Um, I'm John Tuckman. I'm the snow safety manager uh, for ski patrol up here at the ski resort. 
and welcome to our first backcountry chat of the season. Um, this is put on by the Peter Engels Memorial Avalanche Education Fund. Um, I will talk a little bit more about that in a little while, and I will talk a little bit more about some of the Pi Fund programs that are going on this season. Um, but I want to get to our uh, Avalanche Center presenters because these folks um, were generous enough with their time and eyeballs to uh, come over from Silverton to give you this talk tonight. And they want to get back out of here as quick as they can so they can get back to work tomorrow in the middle of the avalanche warning that they hoisted this afternoon. Um, so tonight um, we have a couple of presentations from the CAIC um, and then I am going to talk a little bit about locally what's going on in the front yard, what's going on in the side yard. Um, but for starters, we have Bex Hodgetts from the CAIC. She's the um, lead forecaster for the Southern Mountains, which is a humongous area of land to cover. And Jeremy Yanko, who's the North San Juan zone forecaster, backcountry forecaster for the CAIC, which is basically half the Southern Mountains, right? We, we go to Lake City. So um, if listen closely when they ask you to submit observations, because these guys can really use all the eyes in the field that they can get. It's impossible to be in all the drainages in the zone at once. So without further ado, please, Bex and Jeremy, take your Thanks, John. Um, for the warm welcome, it's, uh, Bex and I appreciate the invite to come over and uh, to be amongst such a, a great ski culture that's instilled here in, in Telluride. Um, you know, equally, we're, we're psyched we can contribute to the memory of Pi and the Avalanche Awareness Initiative that you guys have created and sustained. Um, so I'm a newbie with the CIC. This is my first season. Um, it will be my 25th season skiing um, in this cluster of Colorado. Um, so looking forward to this, this 25th one. I spent the, the majority of my snow career over, the, over at the Silverton ski area, 15 seasons there, and then a couple other gigs here and there. Um, so been tinkering with some avalanches for a while. I'm stoked to have a change of pace. So really looking forward to this. Um, here is what we term over on just the east side of overpass the east lookout or some people might call it the b5 that's the apron coming out just that orange peel deep near surface faceted snow that was on sunday i'm sure some of you guys have been seeing some of that raise your hands if you would as who's been out there in the snow in the last like month two weeks months is there anybody who wants to maybe say what you describe the snow as? So one word, two words, any, anything that comes to mind? Weak. Weak. Shallow. Shallow. Yeah, that works. Weak. Shallow. Dry. Faceted. Yeah, all that, all that good stuff. You know, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, kind of a saying that I, I've heard a lot over time was, you know, there's no such thing as bad snow. It's just a bad attitude. And, <laughs> You know, this, this snow is, I would say, is like a good pile of junk right now. It's kind of what we're working with. But what's coming on deck right now is hopefully going to going to shift gears and uh, maybe lend to something we can, you know, put some trust in down the line. We'll see. Tonight, tonight's going to speak or say a lot. So, let's see here. Oh, and again, I'm not, I'm not a savvy presenter. So bear, so bear with me. I'm just getting rolling here. <laughs> um, so this out all, all came in last night from Chris Dixon. I don't know if you're in the house. So, uh, appreciate that. You know, this really illustrates the, the pile of junk. <laughs> so we have on the ground. Uh, it almost looks like there's a lot of dust in that snow. Right. I guess you're just playing, playing tricks. <laughs> but uh, if you know, if all goes well, and if we receive, you know, the high-end snow totals tonight, 
you know, intense precipitation rates. I mean, we saw a variety of, of precipitation rates on our way over this evening. We, have, we also saw rain lines uh, just before the Keystone Gorge. It was, it was raining. Uh, it was pretty dry on the west side of the divide. Um, but nonetheless, it's kind of a juicy, a juicy storm. So hopefully we get a lot of weight. We really test the snowpack. You know, ideally, if we flush, we flush this stuff, kind of start anew, or at least test it, see how it reacts. The, the fear would be if we just get enough where it's not going to tip the scales and it's hanging around and then we're tiptoeing for a new, who knows how long. So again, this storm, I think it's just, it's just going to say a lot. It's, we've had this, this, our snowpack's been sitting around for a while and it has yet to, to really go through any sort of tests. Um, so looking forward to what goes down the pike tonight, tomorrow. More. So just get a sense of where we're at. People said it's dry. Yes, it's dry. We had a kind of a lackluster November. Lizard, lizard head pass, uh, snow water equivalency uh, from, from the snow tell site. This, this particular graph is reading that the lizard head pass site is 14% of the median. So that sounds pretty grim. Um, but we might be playing catch up quite quickly. Nextly, perhaps, is the Red Mountain Pass, I guess. It's the Red Mountain Pass. And I found this kind of interesting. They're saying 72, 72% of median. And that just doesn't quite add up because I, I have dug over on Lizard Head Pass just below Yellow Mountain, and I found a very similar height of snow two weeks ago as I have on Red Mountain. So I don't know how that all equates. And of course, that was just a few random holes in, in a big area um, in both places. So just, just to kind of line it out and to speak to our, our current circumstance, but potentially we're, we're playing catch up here soon. Uh, Bex threw on those graphs. And so I thought I'd sort of orient my talk towards it. Um, and then, you know, thankfully we get, we get a lot of information from the local Ski Patrol. Awesome Ski Patrol you have here. I'm guessing this is the site at 11850, is that? Yeah, that's that Patrol right? headquarters. Um, so the, the weather graph um, is from November 8th through December 6th. So we have the last month. It doesn't really obviously include when it starts snowing again. And uh, there's there's not really a lot to, to point out here. Not a lot of snow, not a lot of wind. What I did find interesting though, uh, is the high temperature, the average high temperature was 39 and a half and the average low temperature was 27 and a half. It's a pretty narrow um, temperature gradient there. Pretty warm nights, right? And pretty darn warm days. So. You know, taking that with the grain of salt, or pretty obje objectively, based on just what we felt this last this last month, you know, very much more like fall, not late fall, or like an extension of September, basically, um, is that that probably helped our snowpack. You know, we didn't fast it. We weren't. We didn't have accelerated fasting. It wasn't really aggressive. Um, you know, it, it it gave this snow kind of a chance. It could have been worse. It could have been cold. And clear the whole time, and maybe the snow would be even be weaker than what we're seeing right now. Possible. Um, but however, you know, the snowpack that we have is old and tired. Uh, the snow, uh, this is looking down off the southeast, southwest shoulder of Lookout Peak into the uh, Ophir Valley uh, two week and a half ago. Just to kind of give you an idea of you know snow coverages, and this is your neighborhood, so you probably have a really good idea. But it was a nice bird's eye, just trying to get a broad, broad idea of where the coverage is at, and you know how to make slope selections on down the line. Um, but this per my log and keeping track of snow so far this fall, September 28th or so is when we started getting snow sticking around on the high north. So we've had some snow accumulated and sticking since late September. And then we move into October, a little bit of a lull and our first actually best storm um, bumping up to, into whatever's transpiring right now. That was on October 12th through the 14th 
and we had uh, 16 to 20 inches of high density snow laid down. And it was a nice little storm. It was, uh, you know, kind of looking promising, of course. And then we we warmed up. Onset warm weather uh, was followed by a couple little skipper storms, one to two inches. I think it was right around the 10, 18, October 18th, October 19th zone. And that, I think, I'm calling it like the 10, 19 layer is when it was buried. And I've been seeing that pretty evidently throughout most of the holes I've dug, whether it be northeast of Silverton or on this side. However, that thing has been degree, degrading. It's a little tougher to detect. Um, Bex's husband last year uh, sort of identified a similar layer, maybe a, a layer that was giving us some tricky conditions last season as an eggshell layer. Um, the very faint crust, and that crust is getting more and more faint. However, it's nice and planar. It wasn't old crust, and then it's got that little bit of fasted snow on top. Um, it's it's becoming more hod homogeneous and tougher to see. It is still there, um, but the 1019 layer, we'll see if it, it shines again. But it's something that's been concerning to me in my findings and kind of consistent. Have you guys been seeing anything like this over here? Anyone out there? Seen a layer down there about 50 centimeters? Eggshell layers are perfect for us. Yeah, okay. it's like super thin, not fragile, inconsistent, but there. Right on. And Was this it? morning already, there's reactivity on that layer halfway down the pack. On that layer that you guys are mentioning. Okay. I think I for us it's more like 30 to 40 CMS. Okay. Right on. Good to know. Kind of aligning, which always feels good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it makes you feel better about what you're saying, of course. Um, so, you know, moving forward from that storm, we um, the one to two inch on the 10, 19, yeah, warmed up again. And then the, the runner up storm, here's a little image of sheep. Mm -hmm. that, this is the, the toe or the apron of Sheep Mountain Expanse, kind of, you know, looking towards the west side of the Ice Lakes group above Trout Lake. Um, you know, just again, trying to throw some imagery out as my findings and where coverages are and slope selection down the line. Uh, but the, the runner up storm second place for the month of October, which was quite a while ago, uh, <laughs> 10 to 12 inches, wind blown, a lot of wind. And then that was followed by, I believe our most potent wind event um, to, to get last night today might be a, a solid competitor, but we had a pretty sustained north wind event 36 hours, high 20s. So other night it was pretty tame. Last last time in the fall when we had a lot of snow on the ground, the wind was honking a lot out of the north. So at least that was really evident um, kind of on the other side of the pass, 12 miles away. Um, and I think that also kind of led to some of that, that funky setup that was um, keeping us on our toes for the majority of last season. However, less winds is, uh, is the point of all that. And uh, so that was, I mean, that was, that was nice, you know, it was, it was still, but we've been whittled down to something like this, you know, over the course of the last month, this is up Paradise Basin, just the east side of the mm. past. Mm. Um, so you can see your east facing, you know, east facing aspects right around tree line, slightly above, you know, it's, there's not much coverage, it's really spotty. And then you start heading east, tinkering with southeast, you know, of course, it's just burnt out. As you move down from that drainage, like as you're looking east, northeast in the Silverton, each subsequent drainage just has less coverage, and less coverage. And then one shows up, it's got a little bit more coverage. It's a really erratic coverages on east and west, near tree line, above tree line. So, you know, going forward, poking around some more and just assuring that indeed you're not on a lot of these old surfaces might, you know, might very well be the, the, the make or break factor. I, I found some really uh, different snow types or supportabilities when I'm just making the most micro aspect change. I'm heading up northwest and man, I go just a little bit more west and it's a supportable crust, but just a shade of north, um, you're kind of wallowing, you're falling through the snowpack. Does that, does that sound pretty fair to what's going on? on this side. 
yes. unsupportable on the north. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat of a structure on east west. Yeah. yeah. Supportive for us on the east west and ski pen to the ground on north. Okay. Ski pen above tree line or near below? Near below. Okay. Yeah. Similar over there. Um, so, yeah, this is what we're whittled down. We're what we're whittled down to. Um, furthermore, kind of just like our our uh, you know trailing the storms and just trying to make this talk as engaging as possible and you know walk 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 you through this because we haven't had a whole lot to talk about uh, tonight tonight really is is that is the highlight it's the, it's the headline um, but uh, we had another three inches let's see yeah th oh no we had a uh, like a three inch average um, per storm in the month of November. Uh, so if you can, if there's so much warm weather mixed in, it's hard to believe that we, I think that the biggest storm was about six to eight inches. That was more towards the latter part of November. But uh, my averages were showing almost a storm a week, one to three inches. And that was the month of November. And then, yeah, this is sort of the, the end result of that. The 11-24, the November 24th, 25th, was our last significant storm up until Tuesday this week. And that was uh, that was kind of a beauty, um, sort of like Tuesday as well. Not a lot of wind associated with it, uh, higher density snow. But this is, this is the only thing I could find out there. Uh, granted, it's pretty limited in a very large area, but just some big sloughs. No cracking, no, no other signs of instability this day. I would have, in comparing it to a similar snow event this week, the snow was giving me way more feedback this week as opposed to this storm a while back. So maybe it meant so yeah, the snow just obviously deteriorated more so. And it was just a similar type of snow and it did not have much wind to it, didn't have much flat, um, but uh, way, way more sensitive this week. So more to come, but yeah, I hope, hope tonight gives us, gives us what we need. Um, this day too, I was also for my outings um, that I've culminated so far this season. This was a day where I'm like, man, I'm just not staying on top of the snow the same I was my previous outings. This is when I, I really saw some deterioration, and uh, well, that just continues to to go down sort of around the horn here. Uh, after the storm, the thermostat definitely turned back up, as you all know by doing some other things out there. Snow wasn't as interesting um, at this time to you know, try to fulfill my duties as best I can. I started exploring high, you know, high east and high western aspects, you know, due east, due west, 12,000 and, and above. What's going on there? This is from Sunday in that east lookout B5 zone. And I, I found this sort of peculiar because it was a fairly fairly stout crust. It was only about an inch thick, one finger in hardness, some facets below, and then another just imminent crust right underneath that um, of similar of similar structure and strength. But the surface was was runnelled. It's as though the rocks, you know, off the cliffs were kind of melting free and then going over the snow surface. And then you, there's like all these little rocks embedded. I mean, it was very much like mid spring, something to that effect. Very peculiar for December 3rd. And you said that was an east aspect? Yeah, that was due east at 12 5, just over 12 5. Um, but however, if I got just to Scotia North, it had that orange peel recycled pow deal going on. But stout, pretty stout crust. Um, I had spent a day, let's see, December 1st, went over to, um, to the, the South Lookout Peak. And those, those are from that images from the top there looking into Ophir. And that, that aspect is much more, it was a stouter crust, more like a four inch melt freeze going on, on high elevation, due east. Uh, so slightly more robust crust seam going on on the east as opposed to the west. Uh, there was actually like legitimate corn skiing going on that day. Is something yeah. like that? Yeah, I just dug on a north aspect to see no sun. Uh -huh. There's still a crust there. 
on the well, surface. Yeah, well, no, I'm not on the surface. Barry bought a Reese's for six inches for Monday night. Okay. And so, what's that? 11, probably 200. Right. So I'm curious, do you think that's a melt freeze crust or some sort of like radiation precipitation? My assumption is it's a, like a temperature crust. It, yeah. it got warm enough. <laughs> It got warm, the last layer is a little dense, and that's potentially what made that 11.2. I don't know. Anybody else got some thoughts on that? Yeah. No? We, we were seeing some, I, I saw something similar aspect and elevation today, and I, it seemed like a sun crust to me on east. On due east. The, yeah, pretty due east, northeast, maybe. And that was just uh, the Tuesday's event had already crusted over? It was, um, yeah, it was from, there was a little bit of a skin on the new snow from earlier this week under the fresh stuff, yeah. Okay. But it's, you know, it, it wasn't doing, it, it seems like it's going to get mushed away tonight. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of crust facet combos, you know, really is is the lump sum of the story. I the, this surface I found just peculiar because it, you know, like falls the new spring is what's going on here. Hmm. But uh, on the east, yes, a little stouter um, at the surface, and then the pack was really moist as I went down, uh, almost again like spring mid layer, pretty pretty robust. Robust crust and facet crust, facets to the ground. But at least there was some moisture in there. It wasn't just a big dry pack of, of junk. Um, so the this is another shot just up my sheep mountain tour. And this is at that lovely near below tree line. Uh, just just kind of complement uh, Chris's picture uh, just just another shot of, of some action in San Miguel County here that that layer that kind of 1019 layers just in there about halfway in the pack at least over on that on that side of things up on lizard head um, but at this time and that was two weeks ago I was getting boot pen to the ground uh, skis had a little bit more integrity you know it's keeping you up it, it was it was all right where there was snow coverage but you know, there was, there was pretty limited snow coverage and, and you know, kind of still is. So this, this stuff is just primed for failure and, you know, skier trigger, as we already know, I think Chris submitted something the other day. Uh, there were some observations uh, kind of on the Silverton side of things up Cement Creek predominantly where you just got in that sweet 38, maybe 40 tinkering with the 40 degree slope angle and you can just wash away whatever feature you're on. They're not large, they're you know, barely classifiable as a D1 likely, but uh, you know, can, can cause you, you know, a knee tweak or something of that effect. Point being is you got sensitive. You got sensitive really quick. And I mean, I would suspect there's already some naturals going on below tree line, you know, as, as we're sitting in this room, but we'll see. <laughs> Uh, so it's just a little, there's just no body to that snowpack. So tread, we'll just tread lightly for a bit. Um, so Tuesday, the Tuesday storm, get a little bit more in the present. This is just one of those little areas us practicing some slope cuts on and see how sensitive it was. And it, it had slab and characteristic. You know, it just wasn't this big sluffy pile, but sort of behaved like a slab, but then just in train and grab more snow and just a just a big old pile of uh, loosely facet snow almost riding on the ground or almost initiating at the ground, but not quite running 7,500 feet. Um, similar things apparently found it found over in Hofer. Um, and then a couple of these um, Silverton side of of the compass, if you will. This was northwest, northwest below tree line, and it was just that magic. I was, I ascended this kind of feature uh, 20 feet to the left on a due west, and it was just easy breezy cruising up the supportable crust underneath the new snow. But a little trend to the north, unsupportable, 
give a little more slope angle. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what you got. But it was good to get some feedback as to where we're at and indeed how sensitive it is. So just fingers crossed, hoping for the best that Mother Nature provides a really, a really solid snowpack test tonight, mm -hmm. tomorrow, and maybe again next week, a couple of times. So sort of um, moving and shifting directions real quick. I uh, just want to outline the, the inner workings of this public safety service message that, that we're, we provide and we disseminate. Um, yes, we have three forecast zones. Uh, Tuffman already kind of alluded to that. We also have the Sangre de Cristo range over there, which is a wonderful lump of mountains. It just doesn't see, apparently, it doesn't see a lot of winter use. And uh, the snow can be fickle. They can get completely hammered on, or currently they've been a little light um, as opposed to what we've been seeing. And obviously we've been light. But if you sort of, if you, if you head over to the San Juans, kind of use the Rio Grande drainage as sort of the division of north and south. If you head east to sort of highlight the southern San Juans, the La Garita, Wolf Creek Pass, so kind of where all the usage is going on. Um, and then of course there's a there's a fair bit of wilderness in between. And then you get your cold bank kind of molus zone and then the La Plata group and then kind of south of Rico. So that's kind of the, the southern tier of the South San Juan forecast zone, North San Juan. Lake City, Cimarron's, Red Mountain, um, north of Silverton, and then Snapples, Telluride, Oper, Rico, Wilson Group, Lone Cone. That's, that's your, north, your North San Juan. And some say that's the size of Switzerland. It's, uh, it's not <laughs> whole, that whole zone, but 10,000 square miles. So we have Bex. Bex is our lead forecaster. She's based out of Silverton currently. She fulfilling, uh, she's fulfilling Mark Mueller's shoes. He was over in Pagosa Springs forever, uh, doing fulfilling the lead forecaster job. And then uh, Chris Bilbury is our Southern Mountains uh, backcountry forecaster. So kind of my like close partner. Uh, he's on his fourth tier, which is great because these positions, you know, kind of seem to be a little bit of a revolving door. But he's he's hanging tough, and I'm I'm hoping to serve it right as well. Um, Ann Malik, who's been around for a while, she's over um, in Ridgeway. Some of you folks might know her, so she's a solid wealth of information. She kind of monitors the Lizard Head Pass um, zone, making sure highway travel is clean and clear. <laughs> and then she's on red as well. Jeff Davis, who lived here for a bit, he's over in Silverton these days. He's, he's also sort of on the, the meat of the Red Mountain Pass corridor. And then Colin, Colin Mitchell, he's also out of Silverton, and he's kind of the southbound 550. So that's our crew, seven forecasters. So together we work, uh, you know, pretty intimately to, you know, keep track of what's going on and make good decisions. Uh, and we have to, we have to kind of take that to our, our folks, our, our, our broader team, the, the state team, which is uh, comprised of around 25 folks, 23, somewhere in there. But we'll, we'll have a sort of a Southern Mountains group discussion ongoing. And then the day that we're issuing a forecast, we take everything we have, we have to compile that. We take public observations, field reports. Was there an avalanche? Was there a natural, human trigger? Great, awesome. What's the weather doing? I'm gonna look at the weather. My teammates, my close teammates are looking at the weather. And then we take it to Boulder because they're sitting next to the, the folks at NOAA and they're on the master controls and we're comparing notes. And then we, we have this sort of morning Skype group chat and we, we come to some determination of what's that? It could be, it could be for, but, uh, there's some, yeah, there's, you know, it's, there's a lot of opinions and um, a lot of information to work through, but it is a nice big group effort. It's not just one person putting their finger in the air and you know speaking from what they're perceiving. There's a lot of folks, folks' input that goes into each morning's forecast. So the Southern Mountains group will like, here, here's what we got. This is the avalanche problem we think we have. And this is the trend, this is the danger. And then they might question us. You know, and there's gonna be some folks from all over the state saying, oh yeah, you think this, why not this? Because this is what we're seeing. Obviously we're in a different boat, but we kind of have to, 
have to uh, you know give credit to our decisions, but it's awesome because it gives way more more information and, and I think ultimately it creates a more solid, accurate product when you have all this information. So it's not just a, a one or two people shooting in the wind, but the the public observation, uh, Tuck already alluded to it. You know, that's critical. This is a public service forum. This is a sharing. I know you share within your guide groups. You know, I worked for a place where we didn't share a lot of information uh, whatsoever. So I, you know, implore you to take a little bit of extra time and, uh, and send out an op. You saw an avalanche, you saw something peculiar, you triggered an avalanche. I mean, I, I always found it embarrassing when I triggered an avalanche, but I also find, found it to be a good thing to, uh, to kind of hone it. You don't have to put your name on it, but do it. Tell, tell somebody, tell everybody, put that op in, take credit for it because it might help out the next person and, and their decisions they're making down the road. Um, I, the, last, the last one I kind of got in trouble with, I, I was very reluctant. I'm like, man, there's been some people skiing, skiing there recently. I've been out there with some, with some folks that are really knowledgeable and I was surprised and by God, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that observation in there. So please, please do that. Um, Bex is gonna, that kind of segues the backs. Thanks for hearing my ramble. That's a really good question because I was watching, I was on social media today, so I got to sit back and just read everybody. Um, <laughs> You know, we had been talking in the south about just going straight to Persistence Lab and using a little bit out of, we kind of did it a bit this morning actually, and we had Storm Slab on only a couple of aspects, which is normally, if you have a Storm Slab, it's around the compass. Um, and then we and then we highlighted north, I think. Um, but I don't know, we're going to have to hash it out in the morning. It's going to be interesting to see which way we go. We... What kind of behavior are we expecting, right? So as forecasters, we like to think like, what, what's gonna be the simplest message for the public? Like what information do we want them to take away and use that day and apply? Um, and you don't wanna list three problems. You know, we, we do occasionally, but we try really hard not to do that. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, a good example was I went to bat last week I wanted to have storm slab and just talk about drifting on north and I got the full on beat down and we went with north, we went with wind slab and no storm, which is fine. I mean, whatever, <laughs> like we all talk and hash it out and work out what's the best message for the public that day. So that's a really good question. I'm kind of interested to see what's going to happen in the morning. But my guess is we, it depends on if, if we end up in that horrible area that Yanko mentioned where we don't have quite enough snow overnight to really test that layer and we don't get that natural cycle that we're expecting, which is like, horrible worst case scenario really we're going to be tiptoeing a fine line for a while um it may end up being wind slab but if we expect if we get the heavy load and we're expecting propagating fractures so when we can't decide between um between problems sometimes we'll go to the travel advice you know what what travel advice do we want to give people like are you is this a top-down avalanche problem or are you going to trigger it remotely or from below so if we thought that that was what was going to happen tomorrow we'd probably go persistent slab we're worrying about northerlies mostly right everybody knows that probably by now hopefully um if not we are and um uh due to all this <laughs> junky snow that we've been talking about that's that's persisted on north aspects with the other the other aspects and haven't got the same situation going on so thanks not just you'll have to read the forecast in the morning and find out <laughs> <laughs> i think no yeah anyway so we'll see yeah any other questions about of the cycle there's a we have a really high degree of uncertainty and we trended towards conservative calls just if anyone was was wondering we did go to high to overnight tonight um we'll see what we get in the morning but you know a number of factors we try not to let public behavior like um influence the decision that we're making but you know it's the first decent test it's coming up to a weekend we just want really grab people's attention and say you know we're really concerned about these areas so we thought we'd on the side of caution with this one and, and go to high we may get there or we may not so we'll, we'll find out in the morning yeah 
the little sun goes out there on the end, they're still at low. <laughs> Makes for easy forecasting. <laughs> but yeah, so I was going, to, oh yeah, I'm back, sorry. Um, so I'm the new lead forecaster down here in the Southern Mountains. I was in Durango last season, I'm up in Silverton this season. Um, as Yanko said, I took over from Mark Mueller. Prior to that, I was the lead forecaster for a Central Mountain Zone um, with the CIC. And prior to that, I was a, and I, at the same time, actually, I was a highway forecaster. Um, I started with the CIC as a backcountry forecaster in the Bell Summit Zone. Um, and prior to that, I was assistant patrol director up at A Basin. Um, and then before that, if you haven't picked up, I'm from New Zealand. So I spent a lot of time bumping between there and Canada. The usual ski patroller thing yeah and then uh, and then somehow I ended up here but I got the opportunity mm -hmm. to come down here and my husband works at Silverton Mountains so it seems like a good time to make the move and I'm a, I like to think of myself as kind of a jack of all trades I know everywhere kind of well <laughs> but I definitely rely on these guys that have been around here for a lot longer than me um, yeah and as, as anyone who's had any management experience has spent a lot of time doing payroll and buying monitors and, super fun stuff like that but I, I am able to help out almost everyone so yeah we have a super solid group of forecasters and it's like to have ankle on the team this year but um I was going to go over really quickly submitting observations and then introduce a new tool that we have on our website there's been some a team of um, our forecasters working super hard to make some pretty big changes to our website and we're almost ready to roll one thing out so I'm going to introduce you to that today um, and there's some other really exciting stuff, but I, they won't let me talk about it, so you have to wait. But anyway, so submitting off, um, as Yanko said, 10,000 square miles is a ridiculously large amount of terrain, so we appreciate any odds that we can get. Um, Telluride, historically, have, we've gotten a bunch of odds from this area. The ski patrol is super supportive. They, they share a ton of information with us. It's really, really helpful. Um, so we love that relationship. And I'm here to show you how to do it if you want to take part. So this is what our observation page currently looks like on the website. Um, and there's two ways to do it. So you can submit a field report. Um, I wanted to go over what, what our information, um, what we do with the information that you give, because I know, if, I'm not sure if you guys remember the Loop Road accident incident from a couple of years ago where some gentlemen um, provided us with a video and they had triggered an avalanche down onto a, a loop road, which is by the Eisenhower Tunnel, which is an open highway. It's a CDOT turnaround really, but there's traffic going through there all day and um, buried the road. And then they submitted, they gave us the information. Um, we are a government agency. So you guys, you know, your taxes pay for us. So it's public information, everything that we give. So, um, if we are, if another government agency asks us for information, we supply it. We don't give it to any agencies outside of the government. So. But we will see. So what we will do with your information is um, we use it for our forecast, obviously. And you can see it in the public view. As Yanko said, we can hide that and you can be anonymous if you'd like. So if you just want to let us know that, you know, you saw an avalanche or what have you, or you triggered one, you can tick an, an anonymous box. I'll show you how to do that and, um, and submit it that way. Um, but if you're worried about getting in trouble, there's no obligation to get us know. But so just, just so you know that, I know that was kind of a contentious little event. Um, but anyway, so we may use the materials you submit in our bulletins and our social media, um, anything that we think our job is to get the message out there and share information with the public. So um, that also means that anybody who has is doing their own work, like you guys can pull any of that information as well and use those photos, what have you, um, it's just public domain. So if we want to share the information, we don't care who uses it. Um, spreading the message is what's important, right? So there's no protection stuff going on there. Um, we don't, so what we don't do with your information, we don't give an email to anybody. Um, we don't provide it to groups outside the avalanche industry and we don't provide media to any non-governmental groups. So if you've hit anonymous and, and you don't want this information being shared, you can just put a, a put a note in there and we lock it and then the public can't even see it, but we still get the information. So that's a, that's really helpful for us and that option is there for you. If you had any questions about that when you're submitting an observation, just call the Boulder line. It's the number is right there on the website and they'll take care of whatever you need. Take it, take it off, put it on, whatever you need. So any questions about that? I was sort of expecting maybe some questions, but okay. So submitting observations on the website. There's two different ways you can do this. So if you go to um, if you go to our homepage, it'll have um, observation tab there, and just click on that. It gives you a bunch of options. There's two differences that different ways that you can do this. You can submit observation, or you can 
submit a field report. And basically it's the same thing. A field report is for people that want to give us a little more info. So it might be guides or professional people that have been through avalanche courses and they know how to code avalanches or they're going to submit pit data or they want to talk about snow pit tests, what, it, what have you. So um, that would be a place for the field report. If we get that information in an observation, however, we may take it and code the avalanche for you, and then we'll put a note there in the observation. So we can edit, and we do edit some observations sometimes, just so that it come up in the tables and people can see when there were avalanches in there somewhere, and you guys can see that. So any questions with that kind of stuff? You don't have to, these, these can be quite daunting to look at, and it doesn't have to be super professional. Like, we don't really care. Like, uh, so what we want to know, if you've seen an avalanche especially, is elevation, aspect, guess the size, guess, you know, any other information you can give us. A photo is perfect, like a photo tells, tells the whole story normally. So photos are great. Um, there's ways to upload photos as well. Um, and then if you go into the field report, you can go into in-depth about your snowpack tests, you can go in-depth about the weather, you can talk about where you went. You don't have to tell us where you were. Um, if you don't want to tell us where you were skiing, but you but you could tell us it was around Telluride, say this is a northwest slope on the western side of the North San Juan zone, that's fine. Like we don't really want to tell everybody where you ski to tell us. So <laughs> not a problem. Like we just want to know if there's activities, you know. So if you want to do that, it does bring you up with you have a map there as well, like it comes up on the page and you just move it over to the next room and just be here, right? So no big deal. Um, right. So OBS versus field report, that's what you see on the website. The easiest way to submit an OB is through the app. So we have a free app, it's sponsored by Black Diamond and then paid for anybody, paid for also by anyone that donated to the friends. Um, they fund this app. You can pull up uh, each zone, you can pull up its forecast, uh, weather report, oh, sorry, um, weather forecast, and then you can also submit an OB and it's all drop downs, it's super quick. Snap a photo and send it in, you're done. You don't have to sit there on the computer at the end of the day. So that's my favorite way for to submit OBS. Well, obviously, I, if, I'm getting, if I'm working, it's different. But on a day <laughs> off, take the photo, send it in, you're done. Um, so, yeah, any questions about that stuff? You know, we really appreciate it. Um, Yanko's, a, oh, yeah, go ahead. Quick ask question. Yeah. Are the descriptions going to be added like, to put more in depth tabs in the summer? I don't think so. Yeah. Like the field report stuff, you mean? Or no, it should be more in depth, but you just have a talk and you're on the day before that. Oh, know, the discussion. discussion. No, that's, that's, that's a good question. Thing. I don't know the answer to. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. Oh, so this is the exciting thing. And I'm going to try and do this live. So bear with me because it will work. All right. So on our website, this is not live to you guys yet, it's for us, we're just trying to blow it up for one more week before we put it out, <laughs> get rid of the bugs. Um, but this is going to be our new Avalanche visualization page. And um, if people have been hanging around us for a little while, we'll have seen some of our social media posts or presentations where we give you these roses with the avalanches and the aspect and a bunch of good info. A lot of people ask, why can't we see that? Good question. So now we've made it for you guys to use. Um, and it's pretty cool. You can choose your date. You can use the, uh, let's go to this one. You can use the map to do, zoom in on your area. Um, you can choose your date. So you get the option of today, yesterday, last seven days, whatever. Um, you can choose your observation type. So do you want a back country? And then you can choose, I just thought you might not be able to see the highway, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, you can choose the avalanche type and there'll be a list. So as the avalanche type, oh, you can't see this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this. Damn it, I'm clicking away and you guys can't see it. All right, <laughs> so, all right. So you went to the North San Juan. The red here is human triggered, the green are naturals. Um, up in the corner up here, you see the date. You can drop that down and pick your date. Um, Observation type, it's going to be, there's a couple of different options. We can see different things than you guys can. So I can't remember exactly what they are, but they'll be backcountry ops for sure. And then avalanche type, depending on what avalanches we're having, you'll be able to select from that kind of list, from that list. Um, over here is the rows. So I picked um, this year and it's every zone. So 
there's the rose that shows you the avalanche, the elevation, same as the rose that's um, on your uh, in your forecast. So um, above tree lines in the middle, near tree line, below tree line. And then you'll be able to see the distribution of the avalanches. So you can see quite clearly here that north and northeast and east have been most active so far this year. Um, oh, no. I've screwed it up. I know. Oh, the pointy thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe. No, thanks. Push that. I'm really technologically savvy too. Yay. All right. So here's your road. Um, and you can see that there's this aspect has been most active. Um, not the greatest year for showing this stuff, obviously, but you can get the gist. Here's the red dot. So these are all human triggered avalanches in our different vacancy zones. The green ones are naturals. Um, here it is in a pie graph, if that's your jam. Uh, here's your, <laughs> here's your uh, destructive size. So you could filter these. So when you're messing around on this page, you'll be able to click on, um, I don't think you'll be able to see explosives because that's highway stuff and we don't like to share explosive information with the public. So that one will be gone, <laughs> but um, everything else you'll be able to see. And then the D size, so you could click on D one and a half and that'll pull up in this table all the D one and a halves for the zone or the whole state, depending on what you've selected on the map. So you'll zoom in on the map for the North San Juan. That'll bring up this information for there. Click on, I want to see all the D2s and all that so far this season. And it'll pull up, this is a table and it pulls from our observation page. So this is where uh -huh. observations are important. And then over here will be the link to the observation. Awesome. Um, here, the, this is going to be the point on the map where they are. Again, if you want to be sneaky and move it, it'll show up to where you moved it to, obviously. But anyway, and then here's all our triggers. Um, and here's another, uh, if you like, prefer bar graphs over pie graphs, <laughs> and you can mess around with that. But this is super cool, and it, I don't want to promise you anything, but I think you can download this as a PDF. Oh, you can. There you go. You'll be able to download this if you need it for a presentation or, awesome. I don't know, talk to your school teacher or whatever. Um, yeah. So that's kind of cool. It's amazing how long this took to put together for the guys, but they did a really fantastic job. Um, yeah, yeah, so. What are you all calling this? Uh, he is calling it the. Um, I don't know if this is the official tool, the official name, but currently it's called the Avalanche Explorer Tool. Oh, yeah. And it'll be under the observations <laughs> in the website. So you've got the top bar, it goes forecasts, next tab over the observations will be there. Awesome. Hey. Uh, yep. So you'll, the map over here, you can zoom in. Yeah. And will this, will these, event will this link back to the individual event observations yes Sweet. so this one That's here awesome. click on this and it'll take you to the observation uh -huh. it'll pop out as a separate window awesome. yeah so the more details you can give us see how we have elevation aspect r size d size the more information you give us in your reports then the better that table will be populated nice. yeah it's really fun to play with but we're still trying to break it so <laughs> i think Rumor has it's in the next week or two, but I don't want to jinx it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that is, uh, I think that's all I had, but I was going to see if you guys had anything that you, any questions, anything at all about the avalanche, you know, things you've always wanted to find out about. That didn't know. So if you're, if you um, don't trigger any avalanches, you don't dig a pit, you don't see any avalanches, they're still, something worth submitting to you guys as an observation yeah like what no, would that be no avalanches there is a great observation <laughs> especially if we're telling you you're going to see them um <laughs> there's all sorts of things you, get, you can talk to us about wind loading you can just tell us it was great soft skiing you can tell us it was crappy crusty skiing anything you want to tell us no observation no no avalanches is also an option <laughs> great um <laughs> Anyone else? Come on, it's open season. <laughs> Give it a crack. Uh, thank you. That's it. All yeah, right. Thank nice you. to meet you all. Awesome. Finally. Yeah. <laughs>
I know it's going to be sporty. Yeah, I I Thanks, John. Is that all set? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, before, I, before I get started, oh, okay. um, yeah. let me just say thanks again to, to Bex and Jeremy. It was It's great of them to come over um, in this weather and, and talk to us about the snowpack, which is super timely. Um, it's just going to look great. Um, as I said, mentioned at the beginning, this is um, this talk is a is a Pi Fund presentation. Um, a lot of you are familiar with the Pi Fund. Um, it is a program that was started in, in Peter's memory um, by the ski area, uh, the sheriff's department, search and rescue, and the Mountain Club, and. Um, these talks are sponsored by the Pi Fund and also um, supported by Telluride Helitrax, Mountain Trip, um, Telluride Mountain Guides. So there's a lot of a lot of good people um, supporting this. Um, I also really want to thank Jagged Edge, who has hosted these chats for the first several years um, up up until the pandemic. Um, last year we were on Zoom. That's a really good spot. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, um, in, in addition to Jagged Edge, also a big shout out to Heidi Lauterbach. She's not here tonight, but she has been doing the administrative support for the Pi Fund and for these programs uh, since its inception. And she is stepping back from that this season and um you know if anybody's interested in doing a little administrative work for the pie fund um it's uh it's it's not a huge time commitment and it's an interesting way to get involved in the avalanche community feel free to reach out to me um, or julie hodson if you know her um, about about doing that um, and in addition to these chats, um, the Pi Fund, we sponsor uh, scholarships for avalanche classes. Um, a lot of you are familiar with that program. Uh, we like to sponsor scholarships for recreational classes. Um, we know that there's a lot of pros who are looking to improve their credentials and we're we're happy to consider scholarships for pros if we don't have any recs that we funded. But certainly, you know, if you're just kind of getting your feet wet in the avalanche world and you want to take a, a rescue class or a level one or a recreational level two or something, uh, the Pi Fund would will support that potentially. There's a link to scholarship applications on the um, Mountain Club website there's a link to that um, we also sponsor uh, we we uh, have some radios at jagged edge they're available for rent um, for the bear creek radio program if you have friends from out of town who are looking to come and ski side country or whatnot um, then you know they can go to jagged edge and get their hands on bca radios without buying one um, how many folks in here are new to the area? All right. Um, a, a lot of what I was, there's 
part of what I was going to talk about tonight is for folks who are a little newer, um, and it's a, kind of about the the boundaries on the ski area and um, some of our policies about boundary access, side country access, things like that. And it would help if I had a slideshow for that, but not totally necessary. I have a page. Do you have? Can I get a DNN report? Because I have an DNN report. Yeah, we're, it's busy. It's too my meeting. Well, this is what I got. So. Hold on, guys. We got, you know, like 17 dongles to go with this. <laughs> Hey, Joe, if you both, I make a quick announcement during this lull. Yeah. Do it first, huh? Yeah. So, folks, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm an avalanche instructor with Non-Trip, and I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself. Avalanche instructors over here on the floor. We had our staff training today. Uh, but we're providing avalanche recreational avalanche courses here in Telluride throughout the winter. And if anyone's interested in taking one of those, in addition to the pie fund, tonight I have a $100 Turn it some mountain trip money. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh. And we're really trying to make avalanche education affordable for Telluride locals. Um, and the landscape this year has changed a little bit. And currently, we're the only avalanche uh, recreation avalanche course provider in Telluride. So, with that being said, we want these to be accessible and affordable. So, please see me if you're interested in taking a recreational course with us. This is for a rec level one course. It gets you $100 off, which is basically like 20%. Off, so please find me after this uh, chat. And uh, thanks to the Mountain Club, thanks to the library, and the Pipe Fund for supporting us. So, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Also, level two, not just level one, level two as well. Okay. Okay. Awesome. That's great. So I'm just gonna I, I'm just gonna start talking about this stuff. It's it's pretty straightforward, and I I think it I think you'll be able to understand most of it without pictures, and and a lot of my pictures aren't that interesting anyway. Um, oh, that's interesting. Will will you come up and be my uh, so. In, in our in our ski area, we're in Colorado. We have the Skier Safety Act that sort of guides how we approach some of our signages and markings. But we have a hard boundary around our permit area, so that is going to be that black and orange rope. It's not necessarily going to be flagged, and it's pretty much everywhere on our boundary. Internal closures are also marked with ropes or closed signs. And internal closures may not be roped. You may just see closed signs. And if that's the case, it's still closed just because you can ski around. It doesn't mean that it's not closed. It's just like an invisible rope. Um, and for, you know, for the, for the ski area boundaries themselves, um you're we don't have an insy outsy boundary like some places there um oh, this might happen there we go thank you joanna <laughs> we also need to give a big shout out to joanna and the library for taking over as hosts for this event for a long time uh here and if you guys have been coming to the jagged edge for these for in the past raise your hand if you've been to one of the jagged edge in the past so you remember how we used to have beer and we drink beer in there we're not allowed to do that at the library but joanna said that if Month, the they have a little stash to entice you to come to the next <laughs> And yeah, what what happens in the backcountry chat stays the backcountry chats, okay? Um, so ski resort, um, backcountry access points are, we have four of them, top of nine. Two on the Gold Hill Ridge, 
uh, one on the bald saddle and one on Palmyra, five of them. Um, they are there for egress only. You're not supposed to come back through the gates, um, but if you need to, I'm sure we'll all understand. Um, the, no, I mean, seriously, that it's, it's really about, they don't want people skinning into the ski area and riding the lifts, but you know, I mean, if you go into Delta Bowl and it's really sketchy, just come back into the ski area, you know, it's, it's the easy way to have a better day. Um, so this is the, um, this is the road up to Mountain Quail, the West Lake. This is what our internal closures look like close sign or rope doesn't matter could be both could be one they both mean the same thing um this is our internal gates to our height twos um rope and close sign they'll open and close throughout the day and there are you know slider boards at the bottom of the lifts telling you what's open at that moment um and these are signs that we put out when explosives are in use. We don't put them out when we can't find an extra closed sign. We put them out when there's explosives in use. If you try to cruise around the ski area right now, you're going to see a lot of these um, because there's probably about to be a lot of explosives in use. And uh, if you're anywhere near the prospect ridge and you see one of these out there, you know, near the 11 area, or on the galloping goose, just turn around because there's probably artillery in use. Um, and does anybody here know the range of deadly artillery shrapnel from the point of an explosion? Will Marsh. 600 meters. So it's a long way. It's a long way. You don't want to be. You don't want to be anywhere near an artillery round that goes off. And if you has anybody found any shrapnel on the mountain, any howitzer shrapnel, it's nasty stuff. You don't want that stuff coming through your head at the speed of sound. Um, these are also on our boundaries. And this is Skier Safety Act language. And if you ever wind up on the wrong side of the boundaries, the, the security folks are just gonna point at that sign and say, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, okay, enough about that, right? So this is similar to what Jeremy showed us. Um, this, is our, um, the, this is our snowfall season to date. We've had, um, I, I'm just, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing on the mountain right now, uh, similar to what Jeremy talked about, and then uh, talk really briefly about the Bear Creek access points. Um, we had a really, this year is like a mirror image reversal of last season. We kind of had a really slow start in October last year, and then a really good November. I think we had about four feet of snow last November. This year, we got uh, maybe 40 inches of snow in October, 43, you know, like good snow, good water. These green lines are water. And our base got up to 20 inches before the first of November. And we, the first week of October, we had a crew on the hill. We had uh, winch rolling all the way up the Prospect Ridge from Stella to Westlake. We rolled Dynamo, Electron, Little Rose. We ski packed the six area, ski packed the Dynamo Gully and Lower Electra. We got a lot of work done, and that feels like a year ago. Um, <laughs> it was, we had 10 inches of snow in November. And, you know, like Jeremy said, it was a beautiful, dry month, really, really fall like weather and the you know the snowpack stabilized right around you know 15 inches 10 15 inches for a while and it did deteriorate it's not you know just because the temperature swings weren't dramatic doesn't mean we didn't have a lot of facets everybody who's been on north aspects knows um and we have just kind of been standing pat now until these last couple of days when we've had enough snow to work with. And we got a crew on the upper mountain 
just there's a yesterday was the first day we've had a crew on the upper mountain in a month and um we've really only been working on kind of north facing terrain and it's very similar to what jeremy was talking about it's uh it's a lot of cohesion with snow a lot of well-developed facets um this is what uh this is a little remote trigger up by our cache near the top of six from uh tuesday and we saw a lot of this right you know right after the storm earlier this week anywhere that the snow had been shaped by the wind and blown into little uh soft slabs we saw really easy and remote triggers pretty much everywhere and um the riser uh, the top of the spiral stair skews left slid out the make them reef slid out um a couple of the stairs fingers um everything on the happy thoughts ridge kind of going like the minute you touch it on approach obviously um things are changing quickly oh and that comp the conversation we we're having about the east aspect with the skin on it that was actually mammoth right under the chairlift on that kind of east face that gets pretty sun affected and the thing that surprised me there was not the little crust from you know on top of this new snow from this week but it was how deep the snow is and how uh how bad the basal facets are down there because that area gets a lot of sun it's not super high elevation and there's probably a foot and a half of snow in there with you know uh, 15 centimeters of really well developed facets there's not quite depth for it, but you know, for an east aspect close to 11,000 feet this time of year, you know, for this for the weather we've been having, it's crappy, crappy snow. Um, up, uh, they were talking about wind slab earlier. Uh, we had a lot of wind last night, gusts into the 50s out of the southwest. Um, I was up by the top of 14 this morning. There was uh, one finger hardness wind slab at the surface. 15 centimeters probably and uh foot penetration got it to crack 50 feet um so i would expect that that stuff is going to be sitting under a pretty good load of water by tomorrow morning um and it should just be another nasty layer in the layer cake um and then and coming down uh this afternoon we probably had i don't know just three or four inches of new snow but already seeing a lot of wrinkling and cracking in um below tree line north facing terrain and this was like jaws right so below even you know in the ten thousand foot band so really expect you know by tomorrow any anything northerly that uh had any snow on it before the storm is going to be really, really suspect. Um, and then, you know, specific to the ski resort, what we're looking at here is kind of a zero to 60 situation operationally. Um, starting <laughs> tomorrow, uh, I think there's probably going to be a lot of explosives in use um, all over the mountain. Uh, our, our first area of focus is going to be in the six and nine areas to try and get those ready for the public coming up. But we're also going to be shooting artillery and prospect in the alpine terrain. Um, if the, we don't get a big natural clean out cycle tonight, we're going to try and give it a push. But um, given the snowpack and given the amount of work that we have to do, it's a good time to just avoid the area altogether. Um, and uh, the other thing that's going to be going on up there is everybody, it's not just the snow workers, it's going to be the groomers and the lift operators and the lift mechanics. Everybody's suddenly going to have access to all parts of the mountain. And there's going to be a lot of departments running around trying to get work done at the same time. And that's, that's going to be more of an issue for us than you guys will notice, even if you're skiing, you know, in the four area. But if you do try and sneak into some of the closed terrain or get out, you know, up the Prospect Ridge to access the backcountry, 
you're you're going to see um you're, you're going to be underfoot like winch cables explosives snow guns all that stuff um and i like talking about the ski area at this time of year because it really is backcountry for the most part we really try to process our snowpack by hand by mechanics with explosives so that you know in just a matter of a few weeks it's something totally different than what you guys are looking at in the backcountry and it makes it much easier to deal with with the product that we're putting out there for our guests but right now it's just like everywhere else it's it's dangerous as hell with a new load um so hopefully in a in a couple of weeks um you know we'll kind of be in a more normal uh a, a norm, more normal kind of operational mode. Um, few words on the backcountry access points. Um, they all have these big signs on them. Um, they all have some signs. These, these are forest service access points. This is a forest service sign with a forest service legal mumbo jumbo. There's also some signs, especially in the alpine terrain that make it clear that you're leaving the ski area. You pass a sign that says you're leaving the ski area, you're in a totally different world. Mm -hmm. There's no patrol. There's no way necessarily back up the hill, and there's no easy rescue available. Um, new for this season, this is another pie fund yes. initiative, um, and a big, big thanks to the Jagged Edge for mm -hmm. um, financial support for a few of these. But we are going to have beacon checkers at the backcountry access mm -hmm. points. Um, we're going to have these BCAs at contention nice. and at uh, the bald saddle, and we're going to have two order box beacon checkers up at uh, up on the Gold Hill Ridge at those gates. And we're not going to have one on Palmyra. You know, <laughs> go out that gate on Palmyra. You should probably know, you know, realize what you're doing if you walked all the way up there. Um, so. Uh, these are they're on the hill we need to install them but hopefully by the time um by the time that you feel like using the backcountry access points we'll have these up and um they're really probably not for most of the people in this room but it's just <laughs> another thing to make people realize they're at a decision point and maybe make people stop and ask themselves and their partners some questions about what they're doing, that they should be doing it. Um, so that's something uh, that's something uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, this is the bald saddle access point. Um, I think this is the one that sees a lot of inbounds traffic because I know people like to come back. Um, we say no re-entry, but there's also a nice um, CAIC sign there from the friends of the CAIC that they gave us last year um, with some basic you know, avalanche information. Um, and here's the Gold Hill Ridge. There's the you're leaving the ski area sign. And um, those gates up on that ridge will access Upper Bear Creek. And, you know, most of you guys have been out there and know the situation. If you haven't, um, it's, it's not something you should do lightly or flippantly or just because you see a bunch of people dropping in and it looks like really good skiing. It's extremely complex terrain. It's exposed. There aren't very many safe down routes. And even if you can find a safe down route, you're still gonna be exposed to large slide paths above you. And, um, you know, again, these gates are put where they are by the forest service. Um, I think it's great that we have them, but they belong to the Forest Service and they are, they put them where they want to put them. And it has to do with mm -hmm. private land. And they won't, they won't put public right out onto private land. And I wish that we could get a better resolution of some of the issues we have out there. But honestly, long term. The best answer is going to be supporting the Mountain Club. Those are the guys that do all of the public access work. When these gates went away because there was a private land conflict about 10 years ago, 
it was the mountain club that led the charge to get them back and the mountain club is the outfit that knows who owns all those mining claims and works with the ski resort and the owners of claims to try and you know break these log jams so you know long term you know any if you want that delta bowl gate move you want to gate the top of nelly or top of the stairs like i totally hear you and i'm with you and it's gonna it's it's about resolving some of these private land conflicts uh, with the forest service um, despite the fact that they're forest service gates and we will allow access to them almost 100 percent of the time we'll close those gates um, if if it's going to conflict with work that we're doing and that uh, is most commonly up on the Gold Hill Ridge when we're doing work in the Gold Hill Chutes or Palmyra. And when we have that stuff, when we know that stuff is happening the night before, we'll make every effort to get it out on social media that there's going to be a delay on those gates. So if you've got, you know, if you're planning an early project, you can make other plans. Um, and then obviously it's it's side country. Now it's back country, right? Mm -hmm. It's all back country. Side country is just a head trip. Side country just means there's more people around to mess with your good time. And, um, <laughs> so the the typical back country protocols are super important, you know, beacon shovel pro partner, know how to use your rescue gear, have a plan, have a backup plan. I mean, if you're going to the Joaquin and everybody else is going to the Joaquin, you know, T12 is great skiing. So, you know, the, you know, all these lines are, they're, they're going to be there. And if, if you can't get the right day this year, it'll be there next season. A lot of, a lot of problems happen when people, you got to get something done today. Mm -hmm. um, do your beacon checks. The beacon checker should help with that. Um, communicate with parties around you. Don't drop in on people. That's why the radio program is in place. And uh, it, it's really good. And we, we do have a couple of those radios up at the top of 15. They're not typically on, but you know, if we hear about something going on in Bear Creek, we'll turn them on. And uh, we do, you know, we, we do have communication capability with those BCAs. Um, and, uh, you know, be prepared for self-rescue. There was a uh, situation on March 14th where, uh, you know, we had a 30 inch storm that day. Spring break, we were really busy, waist deep powder. And, uh, you know, we had a member of the public get out in the, in the lower, um, in the lower chutes in Bear Creek, you know, below Bushwhacker. And, you know, he was out there all day. Um, we were too busy to send people in for him and search and rescue, you know, people came up and, you know, by the time we were kind of ready to go, it was 3.30 and we've been out there for hours. And it, it, was, it was dark by the time he got out. So, you know, if something goes wrong, broken equipment, injury whatever avalanche you know it's going to be on your group to to get you out or at least stabilize the situation because help is a long way off and uh if the weather's bad help you know may not be around for a day or two so um you know really just just because it's great terrain and you can ski right from the ski area into town um doesn't doesn't mean that it's not as uh, as rugged and dangerous and potentially remote seeming um, as mm -hmm. stuff that's in the wilderness. Um, any questions, comments? Don, are you going to have some elaboration on that radio program for those who are new to it? Oh yeah, the Bear Creek radio program. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, I didn't put up all the channels and stuff, but BCA. Um, you know, BCA, uh, line of sight, talkies, there are, there's a page on the uh, Mountain Club's website that has dedicated channels uh, listed for 
uh, Upper and Lower Bear Creek, Little Wasatch, Ophir uh, regions around there. So um, I think Bear Creek is 510. Is that right? Um, so it's just it's it's just a way. I mean, if you guys have been up there, you know you can't you can't see the creek from the top of your line. So somebody could be right right below you, and you wouldn't know until you were halfway down. And uh, it's just it's just good to be able to put that out there, and uh, you know call for help if you need it too. Cell phones don't always work back there. Um, and uh, there it is. There's <laughs> our side country. Some of it. This could be very well what that looks like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, that's Tamter, permanently closed uh, area. And uh, that's uh, Tempter. That's the um, fall of 19, I want to say, early this time of year, kind of like right after this first big storm in December. See a lot of these easy triggers that slide on the right was triggered by a snowcat. Um, just driving up there um, and uh, that's about all I had. I will make one editorial comment um, about last season. We had, as most of you know, we had a terrible snowpack. It was a really tragic winter in the region for avalanche accidents and, and fatalities. And um, I don't think that we really saw much traffic in Upper Bear Creek at all until the end of February. I think there were just a handful of parties that went through there. Almost no traffic in Tempter, which uh, there should never be, but I understand that it happens. And I, I really want to give some props to this community for understanding and respecting the kind of terrain and the type of avalanche problems that we were dealing with last season because we could have very easily had the same type of tragedies that they had in San Juan County over here. And I think that the um, clear headedness of, of, of this community really um, kept people safe around here last winter or, or safer than some other areas. So um, yeah, that's, that's about all I have. Thank you for coming. I, um, we don't have dates yet for the next uh, talk. I would, I think we're probably going to be shooting for get back to kind of our Monday night schedule, maybe in mid January, if that works with Joanna's schedule. Um, I, I think the, Joe, the January talk is going to be Ryan Howe uh, from Ski Patrol and Mountain Guides is going to come in and he's got a study of three years worth of pro rescue exam results, which I think would be pretty interesting mm -hmm. to see. Um, you know, what the common errors were on those exams. Um, and then later in the season, we'll probably do a close calls forum in March. We haven't done one of those in a couple of years. And it's, it's usually really instructive for all of us to sit down with folks who've, who've had close calls and incidents and, and talk about that stuff. So, um, you know, we'll get that out on the Mountain Club channels and the library channels when we have those dates and topics. And um, in the meantime, I did not bring the ski boot or the howitzer shell for donations, but uh, <laughs> is that Jackie back there? Yeah. Jackie, will you grab an empty coffee cup for donations? If anybody has some pie fund dollars on the way out, stick them into the coffee cup that Jackie has. And, um, you know, send, send observations into the Avalanche Center. It's not just about helping the next person that goes out like that that goes right into their forecast it's really hard putting forecasts together for this whole zone so um any any information you can give them even like beck said just we had a great time it was good skiing and send some pictures of no action they like that <laughs> any any questions issues comments thanks, thanks for coming you guys <laughs>